And he's also known for ha being the only one who has access on the GitHub organization, <laughs> apart from Elko. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two years ago, he decided to quit his job to become a Nix consultant, and he created the EM Lambda. And then he was managing two Nix releases in 2016. And by the end of 2016, he joined force with IOHK. Give it up. Hey everyone. So first of all, of course, uh, I lost my hair because of doing too much Nix. Um, no, uh, I've started on Lambda X. It's, it's exactly one year now. And the only thing I would like to say, I get about every two weeks an email for help for consulting. So I do encourage everyone to, to start doing Nix consulting if that's what you feel you, you would like to try and do. Uh, and you can come to me and, talk and ask me any questions if you need some help. Um, one of the things that Robin actually talked about, and I would like to add a bit on top of that, is this graph. Um, well, first of all, besides that it's, it's kind of, you know, growing from this small group of people that, you know, they hack out something on their free times uh, on weekends, um, it, it's obviously becoming a distribution which people use every day, right? And you can see that, of course, this big fluctuations between releases are not just security issues, but I think it, I, would, I would claim it's also people you know, um, that have deadlines and <laughs> they, they want to push things upstream, but, but of course they come at the very last minute. And I think that's a sign of maturity, although we have to rethink uh, how to offload uh, these last time release fixes like uh, we talked about uh, before um, at previous talks. And, and with that in mind, um, I, I think one of the major things to, to recon reconsider is how we do contributions. And there is a very good blog post why GitHub can host the Linux kernel community, where it talks about when somebody maintains a subfolder, for example, in X packages, let's say Haskell, um, you would have a tree of forks that then you contribute, for example, to Peter Simons, and, and then he maintains the Haskell changes, and then those get pushed as a batch to Nix packages, right? And then instead of like putting everything into master, you have a fork of master, and then Haskell changes. This is basically how kernel is, is developed. Um, and we have this uh, master workflow right now in the pull request uh, workflow, and they're completely different. And I think m most of confusion comes from there. So why does it matter if, if you're using Nix as a company, y like splitting up everything into a, a coherent pull request is, is not that easy, right? You care about a subsystem and you do a lot of changes. And then you, you, you want to push this to upstream to a maintainer, but we currently say, hey, you're, you know, you're pushing a lot of things right now and we, this will never get reviewed, right? But we already know, for example, for, for Haskell that nobody uh, upstreams one package, right? We, we, for example, commit everything at one side. So there is a bit of contradiction there, and I think uh, this is really important if, if we want to scale in the future uh, to decide what are we going to do. So this talk is going to be m mostly about the major pain points and some tips that I've, I've gathered over the last two years. Um, Part of the, the talk that the honors did was how do you how do you bring Nix to a company? But I think one of the tiny bits missing, and I'm, I'm faulty as that probably more than anyone uh, else, is how do you fast track someone to use Nix, right? Because when you have deadlines, when you have you know production code out there, you cannot just say, hey, you know what? Let's just go and you know to a nice island and talk about Nix for two weeks, and then we go back to real world, and you know everything's going to be fine, right? So there needs to be some incremental changes. How do you get there? And I found uh, actually this blog post to be very, very nice for people. Uh, and, and one disclaimer, I, I, I'm a, I always work with people that have been previously exposed with functional programming. So that, doesn't, that didn't need to be um, uh, explained, the concepts behind it. But they, did, they still need to know how Nix language works, but they're usually used to, to work with types and so, so on. Um, but besides going from you know the language itself, how do you how do you contribute to Nix packages and the whole ecosystem? 
there, there are still some pieces missing there, and I'm, I'm interested. Uh, what's your yeah, What's your um, do you have some suggestions of, of do you have some your own approach to that? So if if yeah, I, I'm interested to talk about that if somebody has something to add. Um, so I, I think that's one of the things that I would like to work uh, on when I have finally have some more free time. And 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 this is actually part of this gradual process of nixifying, right? You go from this impure packaging slowly to to completely. Uh, nixify uh, your your company or whatever project that you have, right? And this is a process, and and you cannot say again, yeah, we're just gonna do one month and it's gonna be done, and then everything will be nix based. So, um, and and this was the the talk that Jonas, uh, that's what Jonas was speaking about, and I think that th there are some things that we need to fix uh, in order to to get this process a bit nicer. So, okay. In Enix itself, we have a couple of functions. How do you get a source? But the main problem is, although you, you might have the very same source that you know cont the c its content is is always the same, you will you will get completely different hashes. Um, and this is this is quite painful once you move away from Nix packages and you're using Nix packages, right? Or and it in, and in this case, it's just custom software living in in a separate repo, right? And so, for example. Uh, Hydra Nix prefetch git uh, has a different kind of behavior than the Nix packages. Okay, we can merge the two, and you know that's gonna get fixed. But that's still you have uh, fetch git and fetch tarball and uh, dot slash dot, right? And the main problem is that all of these have a different derivation name, and that is part of the inputs, right? So because these are kind of nice. Um, names for 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 you know a human, then that means that y you have to re rebuild your your whole package because this this is an input to your derivation, and it will change the hash. Um, and particularly the last one is 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 the worst because who knows where does this name come from if you use a dot slash dot. Sorry. Yeah, it's a parent directory. So what does that mean? If you build uh, this package on Hydra, it's going to have a completely different uh, parent directory than on your local machine, or someone else will have uh, a different uh, parent directory. They might call it dev, they might call it you know temp or whatever, right? So it, it to some extent it breaks uh, reference and transparency because, for example, Nixups uh, default .nix uses uh, dot slash dot, and if you build that on on Hydra, you will never be able to fetch that binary. Because it will have uh, a different name, and and this is extremely extremely painful, especially if you have big builds, right? So, okay, so how do we fix that, right? Well, we have to sacrifice probably the human readable name and just fix to skip, you know, stick to something. But there is, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is no primitive. Um, in X, which would allow you to to switch the name, but but keep everything else, um, and I I think that probably we could add some kind of a rename derivation name, um, but then you would have to, for example, wrap that using the dot slash dot dot slash dot, and you would have a new primitive for accessing uh, a current. Uh, um, Folder, and I think that's uh, without c sacrificing uh, backwards compatibility. That's probably the only sane way. Um, and we have to talk about this because it it is it is in practice uh, really painful. For example, right now we use a fork of Nixops, but we always rebuild it because it doesn't get the the package from from the binary cache. Okay, we um, Jonas talked um, about pinning Nix packages. And you know, uh, as you as you as you create your your custom repo with all the fixes, you know, with custom NixOS modules, with custom packages, and so on, you start to put the you start to put the 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 pinning. Uh, or f at first, you don't pin at all, right? And then suddenly it breaks. Okay, then you start pinning, and then you have these different places, like in shells, you have you pin uh, and you pin in Nix, and you pin in in shell scripts. And you pin on Hydra and so on, right? So then you have this. Then you have to maintain the pinned Nix packages at six places, right? And then you're like, okay, now we have to clear this up, right? And you know, um, 
And another problem that happens is even if you pin, um, when you say Nix packages, this will always you can always leak the host if you don't set it correctly, right? And then you have a problem with the of using two different ones. Um, and you know we have different concepts how Nix packages is, is the search pad is populated, but we have found that the only way to really make this reliable is basically to force the Nix path to be empty, and then use and uh, the, the pinned Nix packages locally. So, so as Taktoa, uh, this was this was actually a joint effort from you know multiple people. I don't take any credit for it. Or actually, most of the things I talk about, it's it's not my work. Um, it's just how do you get things done, right? And 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 so this is this works, right? So this is a, a small snippet you copy paste to every repo because I mean it solves the problem of bootstrapping mix packages. So you, you cannot pull from up from somewhere and then bootstrap because that that's kind of what you want to solve, right? So what it does is it uses the the built-in derivation and um, the the fetch URL and uh, some local paths. And actually the trick is to use the store path so that you can actually. Uh, make this available in sandboxes, and and then you build this and you get mixed packages at evaluation time, and you can just uh, reuse that, right? And we 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 store the mixed packages source in JSON file, and then we have a small command that just bumps that. You say you know set revision to something, and it will update that. Um, and it's very nice. And the, and and the best thing about this is you can have multiple of those files, right? Or you could generalize it that it would consume multiple JSON files, so you could have multiple Nix packages and use it. You know, for example, if there is a bug, you could have two different ones, and one package is built with one Nix packages version, and the other one is with with the first one, right? Um, and actually, we do that for 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 the Haskell software itself. We use a different Nix packages, and then for the machines, we we use a, a more stable uh, version. And that's mainly because of Darwin. We we try to use the stable NixOS release for the servers, but unstable, so that we can get the, the Darwin packages. Although that's about to change. Okay, so so how do you use that? Okay, first you set uh, an empty Nix path. Of course, it can be populated, but the best way to make sure that no, none of the other stuff leaks in, uh, it's very good to to enforce that. And then if you want to use it in Nix scripts, you just say you know export Nix path. And you can do it like that, although preferably if you're just using Nix, you import it directly from the Nix file. Um, one, one warning though, if, if people are using, for example, Gen2 installed Nix, the, the, feature, the, the config that Nix gets will have impure paths and this won't work. And the workaround is, of course, to install Nix with Nix and then you get the, the one that has the um, Nix paths. So this this works pretty reli reliably, and in 1.12, hopefully this is all gone, um, because you can add uh, the SHA attribute to fetch table. And I, I actually think that probably we might just use fetch URL and add the ability to unpack, but yeah, that's just an API thingy. All right. So. <laughs> There is there is a special type uh, in well um, in in Nix where you can actually have uh, a URL without the string the, without the quotes right, but a side effect that's due, due to the RFC um, uh, a you know column A is considered as a an URL and it's converted into a string right so. I, I think that we should we should probably disallow such things because they're they're not too useful, and I think I don't think we're gonna break anyone's code. Maybe we're gonna make it work, um, and um, this is really painful. Why is it painful, right? Well, because we don't have types, right? And then you get this kind of error when something is back to the function, and well, it's really a string, right? I mean, it's not specifically this one. It would be probably a, a bit different, right? And 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 this is this is really painful because it, it's not easy to debug, right? And and this uh, one one line white space uh, changes are, you know, a waste of time, right? Another example is is multi line multi line um, string. So so who who has an idea what's wrong with this example? Yes, the indentation is wrong. So to put it in perspective, our monitoring system didn't work because 
somebody did uh, something like that and it was offset, of course the parser didn't pass YAML file and say, oh, I don't see any contents and the monitoring system just didn't have anything configured, right? This is the, the effect of, of these things. And you, because we kind of rely on indentation uh, in X and we assume it works, this is actually one caveat that we have found that is, is extremely painful, right? And of course now, if, if you want to fix that, it's it's not easy because you would essentially break um, compatibility, right? If 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 you would uh, change the semantics, there would be a white space change, and you would get completely different uh, stop right? So by using different uh, Nix versions, you would have different hashes, right? So if if we ought to fix this, it's got to be you know Nix 2.0. Although talk to Python guys, what happens wh when you when you change backwards compatibility, right? There's lessons to be learned, but it's not impossible. Yeah, that's uh, and there's actually a pull request um, by uh, yeah by Elias as he was speaking before to fix that. So, all right. So just to be clear, I, I'm not I'm not trying to say Nix is bad. We have done great things with Nix. I'm really happy. I'm trying to point out what are the anti patterns in Nix that you have to be careful about, right? So. Okay, then we have two types. One is string and one is path. And one pulls in a folder to Nixter and one just references it as a as a string, right? Um, and and okay, this is how you do it. If you want to go from path to string, you use the string function, right? Oh, and then you're like, okay, but let's go from string to path back, right? And there is a built-in called two path. Well, but it, it doesn't do anything useful, really. Um, you still get a string. So, okay. So, how do you actually do that? Well, if you first uh, assign something and concatenate with a path, then you get nothing useful. But actually, the two path function is is the second example where you first take a path and then concatenate the string, and then you can actually, do, you know, do that. Uh, all right, it's painful, but it's doable. Um, and even more, strings are not as simple as strings. There is actually strings and strings with context. So what does that mean? A, t a context means that this string refers to a derivation, and if you if you use a string summer, then it will de that derivation will depend on that derivation, which is in the context of the string, right? So you can discard the string context or not. And and for example, Nix Repl doesn't make a difference between the two strings, right? Um, so and if you use two string and unsafe discard string contents in different order, you get different things, and they're both a string, right? So there is actually a Stack Overflow question. I think that uh, Nicholas answered. Uh, it probably needs a bit more work that it's going to be complete, um, but I would really like to have a really good explanation of how this works so that uh, it's clear for people. Um, I, I've, I've just represented the problem. I didn't go and actually try to make total sense of it. So, okay, we have some you know, bad parts in X. That's fine. JavaScript has those as well, and it's widely used, right? So um, one, of the, one of the approaches how to fix that is, is by Gabriel, and I really like his work because he's trying to be really pragmatic of you know, how do we fix things? And he, he did a Munich hack project to basically write a Nix format, which would then basically some kind of a static analyzer, which would say, ah, you're doing crazy things. Like, don't kind of concatenate multi-line strings because, you, you know, that's going to end, not end well, right? Um, it's, not, it's not completely working because the parser in Nix is, is not uh, very well defined or it has some special cases. We the anti quoting needs work and there needs there needs to be a special monad implementer to handle that uh, with the current parser. So if somebody wants to work with that, please let me know. I would I would really love to to basically ban these things in Nix and just say don't use two pad and so on. And of course, uh, build a tool that tells you some kind of like a shell a shell check or uh, or hlint or something like that, right? And then actually we could just you know get the habit of using this tool and we're pretty good right of course um we can fix all of those things with with just static analyzing but i think that most of those could be right well then another thing is the the nix strings are terminated by null so if you use random data and you put it in nix strings 
you will get, well, you can see the error, but uh, well, it, it basically says it's not a valid, uh, it's not a valid string, right? And that's because it contains a, a null, and you can represent secret. So this is this is kind of painful. O okay, if you if you put a, a secret into a string and you import it into your store, then it's insecure, right? But sometimes that's okay. For example, if you have a uh, server deployments where you know you you there is it's not just such a security threat or something like that. So we added, for example, key file. Um, to NixOps, which instead of uh, taking a string that's then copied to a machine, it takes a path so it doesn't go to Nix strings at all and it's just uh, copied over. Um, but uh, in general, if we ever want to support proper um, encrypted string, then if we want to represent them in, in Nix as a text, then this will probably have to be solved. Okay, enough of Nix. Let's go to NixOps. So one of the things that, that um, I got bitten by is that actually, who knows how long it takes to evaluate this. It's about half a second, right? And uh, one thing to be, r to, to, to be aware of that if you, if you evaluate an XOS system, it is one thing, like all the modules are evaluated. And if you have multiple machines, there is no sharing between that. Um, you evaluate one machine, one XOS uh, machine, and, and another one, and so on. So it's basically completely linear. Um, so, okay. So for, for one of the clients, basically I, I misused or abused, or whatever you want to call that, Nix, to, to run benchmarks, right? So we have this thing in Nix, we, we can. Uh, in a derivation, we can say this derivation has a feature of KVM, uh, and that means it needs KVM to run. And then Hydra is able to say, "Oh, this machine actually can run KVM, or only thi this machine can only run KVM." Um, so I, I use that basically because we were doing SNAP high-speed uh, networking protocol, and and we would use and, and we would use and Hydra basically to GCU boot benchmarks one per machine and with specialized software in, in a controlled and isolated environment run those benchmarks, right? And what we wanted to know is um, that if we take different kind of kernel version, different kind of uh, QEMU and different kind of our f software and so on, build, 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 build metrics of things and, and see if there's any regressions. And, and we also had support to like patch those so you could like for example, we had some patches, so we could compare them patch software versus other software. And this is just one snippet. Um, so basically, it's, you know, it's a flat map, some sort, and then in the middle, it selects benchmarks, and the benchmark name is a list of benchmarks you want to run, and then it runs, and then it puts all the inputs that those differ from, right? And then it basically builds one, and then just basically uh, flat maps everything into one big uh, attribute set, but you, okay, al you can also do a list. So the problem here was that I inside there I was building I was actually building a VM image that would then be used as a kind of a fixture, right? And the problem was if we actually built uh, 20,000 packages like that and it ev uh, evaluated NixOS 20,000 times, right? And th that took actually the evaluation took like uh, 20 minutes. So with this change, it only took 10 seconds. So, because because Nix doesn't do any sharing or optimization, when you move out creation uh, of of the Nix OS of of this fixture only to be in the the, t the second loop, right? Then it doesn't have to do so much work. Um, and there is actually a paper uh, by by uh, Kodos for maxim uh, maximal laziness, um, and 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 it's basically you can you can make Nix to share things, but then GC uh, becomes a problem because it basically keeps track of of all the inputs and everything, um, and it's not there yet. And it used to be part of Nix actually uh, a couple of years ago. So how do you debug that? There is a there is a Nix count calls which basically prints out how many times Nix called a preamp and how many times Nix called something else. 
But what you don't get is how long th those calls took. And you know, evaluating, uh, in, in my case, the, the, the Nix OS Evil wouldn't call too many times, right? So it was not useful. So I couldn't find a better way. Um, and you know, probably probably there is a better way, um, and I'm interested to hear that. But I I basically just did bi bi bisect, so I pulled code out until I got to the point where I found out, oh, it's it's the it's the fixtures, and then I figured out that what's the problem. So there is some tooling probably to be developed around this, or we can just identify what are the things that are really painful here. One of the anti-patterns is that you, you, when you use NixOS modules, you rewrap them into you know, other functions. And this is terrible, don't do this. It's very temp I did this, I'm, I'm faulty of this, so guilty of charge. But what, what happens then is that when you actually specify uh, inputs, it's, it's not a, a file-based thing, but it's actually a function that you, I mean, an actual module that you pass. And that messes up with NixOS because it, it, it doesn't know that it, 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 a few things it does are, are basically gone. For example, you might lose the, the line numbers and then your error message is going to be anonymous function at unknown file failed, right? And then you have no idea what happened. <laughs> so no, <laughs> don't do that. Um, this, is, this is one of the worst things and, and ah. Another trick is we have NixOS tests, right? And, and then it suddenly fails and you want to know what's going on, but there is no way to go into that machine and inspect it, say it. So I have this local page that I use from time to time. I, I don't know how to really upstream it, is that you tell the VDE switch to basically expose the network in NixOS on tab zero interface. And then if you, if you just add, you know, you have to start SSH and add your, uh, some key to your NixOS machines. But then you can actually go and SSH into those uh, NixOS tests, and you can, you know, I, I just create this big uh, sleep thingy, sleep for two hours, and then I S uh, SSH into the test, and and I can inspect what's going on there. Um, and and I think this is this is really useful because otherwise it's like Travis, you know, it runs there and you cannot access it, and and why do that if we we are able to run the the VMs locally, right? Um, so. Another thing that probably needs to be upstreamed um, and, and done properly. How, how am I doing on time? Ten minutes. Oh, okay. That might do. <laughs> All right. So, Nick Subs. Um, my major problem with Nick Subs, it's, it's really imperative, right? You, you have to run steps, you have to run set arguments, you have to run this thing and other thing and so on. So in, in, in RHK we created uh, this small wrapper in Haskell around it and, and make it a bit declarative. It's not general purpose, uh, maybe one day it will be when we have time. Um, but the idea is that you, you, you can specify what arguments are passed and they're tagged by, by Haskell type. Um, and you know, for example, what files uh, you want the, the the deployment to be. So, for example, in NixOps, if you if you add a file to the deployment, you have to call NixOps modify to 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 modify that state and so on. And this does everything in the background. So every time you you run, you know, deploy, it, it basically sets the arguments, it modifies things. So it's com pretty much declarative. And then. What we also can do then is, like, we can say, oh, if you have, for example, Explorer in there, we're going to do something a bit different, right? Um, and this is actually from our source code. Another very nice undocumented feature of NixOps is that you have this default thingy, and this is an XOS module, which is then included into all machines in your NixOps, NixOps configuration. Um, so. So basically, I encourage everyone that in here actually you would have a list of all your custom modules um, and then they would be available to all of the machines, right? Um, and you can set your, your, for example, deployment defaults and so on. Um, otherwise, you always have to add for each machine and, and usually you, you import this global NixOS module or something like that to, to share the global or common configuration, but that's what defaults does. And I've actually documented this, and in, in this release, it's going to be there in, in the NixOps documentation. 
Another nice feature that NixOps has it you ha you can actually get a node uh, attribute, and this is actually the whole network that you define. So you can go like nodes backend two dot config, and then you know get anything. And and for example, if you wanted to create a big uh, cluster that and get all the IPs in your network, you this you can just basically map through all the attributes and nodes and then get the config networking and public IPv4 and you know you can do the thing and you can access those and then filter for example and stuff like that that's another feature that's not too well known actually I encourage everyone that use nixops to to go through examples because they do include this but usually you, you look at one but for example there are gems hidden in like you know random files that are unrelated i mean they they don't say we 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 you know, this file um, basically tries to explain defaults, but it says, oh, here's an example about EC2, right? And so it's, it's a good idea to go through all of them. So we have been deploying many NixOps machines, and, and the defaults, once you go below 10, are a bit uh, not, not right. For example, if, if you if you copy everything from your deployment machine to the machine to to the deployment machines deployed machines and if you have 100 for example by default it will only copy four and then uh, another four and another four and this will take a lot of time right so you have to set the max concurrent copy to like 20 if you set it too much then it's going to you know hang everything right but even better is that there is now this uh, has fast connection and there is a description of, of what does that mean. So it basically switches between does it copy from the deploy machine to all machines that the, the closures or does it download it from from the cache um, and then try to do the rest um, with, with, with just what the binary cache doesn't have then it tries to copy that. So that there is then a smaller diff of things that need to be copied. And then Hydra, uh, so Hydra, it ha thanks mostly to Shelly nowadays, we have declarative configuration, we have uh, actually, we can test GitHub pull requests in a very hacky way and there is a way to update the status and, and I think only the first one is documented and not even that is, is totally clear. So that's something that uh, if I, I would maybe like to work with. I, own my, I, I run my own uh, Hydra for a couple of customers, but I would really like to document this, th so it would be easier for everyone to do that, right? Um, but again, in, in, a, in a company, you always, you, as I've said before, you almost never have completely pure Nix built, right? There's always some part that's impure and parts that are pure. And um, the problem is, Hydra doesn't do impure stuff, right? It has this Perl plugin si system where you can write some of the impure stuff, right? But that's pretty much it. So then you have to kind of integrate. So basically, you end up with two CI systems at the end, right? One, one that you know what what people do is either they use Jenkins for everything and they skip Hydra completely, right? But I think Hydra has really nice features. Or you use Hydra and then you end up with another CI. So, so um, at IOHK, for example, we use Travis and Hydra, but then the problem is you make a pull request and Hydra starts building binaries, but Travis as well, so it doesn't have the binary cache, right? And, and then you have these two competing, who's going to be first, and, and stuff like that, right? So I've, I've researched a bit, and you know, to be honest, I'm, I'm really disappointed by Travis because they do all kinds of scary stuff that I don't think it's even considered moral because they claim that you get, you know, this many, that this much CPU, but then their their build queue becomes really big and they just throttle that, right? So your your build that took previously 30 minutes takes an hour because they have just reduced your capacity for the CPU and then it times out. So. I call that unfair because I mean you're I, I, you're paying for that, for example, right? So uh, don't do that, right? So okay, we want to control the CI machines. That's pretty clear by now. Um, and and uh, as as Jana said, we, we have found a build guide. Um, so just just to be clear, we we haven't implemented it yet, but we have a pretty clear idea. And, and what it basically does, it runs uh, a, a, an agent on your machine, a kind of a bashy agent, so you can actually run this on your uh, Hydra slaves. 
So the idea is you would have a Hydra that then, then first builds the package and then triggers the build kite to, to run on the same machine, the impure stuff. So you don't have to copy stuff anymore from Hydra. Um, and it has also things like you can secure these environments and so on, um, and these nice pipelines and so on. So I, I think in, a, in the next couple of months we're going to try this and replace Travis and, and you know hopefully have time to write a blog, blog post and report back. And I think uh, Jonas will, <laughs> will keep in touch. <laughs> How does this work? But I have, uh, based on of what I've seen so far, I have uh, very good hopes. And there is Hercules CI that I've started, which is back and written in Haskell and front end in Elm. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to work on it, but I, I do have a budget for that. So if somebody would be interested, please let me know. We w I, I estimate there is about two months of work to get something like what uh, Hydra does. And we would basically reuse the C++ uh, daemons that are there, but mainly rewrite the web part so we can make the API a, a bit better. right? Because one of the nice things that we have in Nix that other CIs don't have is you could just say, you know, Hercules, build me this local thing. It would contact Hercules, and then that would build uh, your thing and bring it back. So it would be basically a build, just it's through Hydra, right? And then everyone else can already benefit from the binary cache. And other things like that. I have one minute, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, Haskell. We're, we're doing mostly Haskell, and there is a, a bunch of front end uh, JavaScript stuff. I think Haskell infrastructure is amazing. I have no complaints. Thank you, Peter Simons. Um, we, we added two things one is multiple output support. Um, let's that, that, that is really nice. For example, if you depend on EKG package in Haskell, it has static files. And that then references the whole EKG package, and then you have the everything up to GHC in there, for example, if you simply statically. Now that out multiple outputs are there, the static files are, are referenced separately, and you don't bring the GHC in the whole closure anymore. And we have, we have built stack to Nix. They're actually stackage, no, stackage to Nix and stack to Nix. They're two different uh, approaches to this. We'll see which one is better. But it follows this philosophy. Let's use developer stack, which is the development tool for Haskell. But let's generate package set, which use exactly the same version as developers did, and then deploy that. Uh, and that's what we actually use, and it works pretty well. There, there are a few things to be fixed, like macOS support and so on. But um, I think it's 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 uh, it, it has shown to be pretty good. And the last thing, this is actually what I would probably like to work on the hackathon tomorrow, is take all of this knowledge and create like a bootstrappy example of how do you basically run your company and how do you start from and you know use these pint Nix packages overlays and these tips and tricks, and then you could uh, just start using Nix OS uh, and Nix and Nix apps as well. And of course, you start with Nix shell like Anna says, but then. The next thing is probably bringing these things in. Um, and I think there is a couple, a couple of things we have learned so far. So if we join forces and we bring this into one maintained thing, of course, we will. it's always opinionated, but we, I think we can work with that. It's going to be really useful for, for everyone. All right, so that's it. Two questions, uh -huh. uh, one question and uh, one request. The question is, um, I've already been bitten by the fact that two path does not uh, create a path, but a string. Is there any reason why not to fix this, just to hack two path in the C++ source to return a path, not a string? Um, well, pr that's probably more a question for Eloqua than me, but I I don't. I, I think that two path was added at one point, and nobody is really using it, right? So I, I don't think there is too much hard, uh, okay. too much. I don't think there is a problem actually fixing it, right? Uh, but if somebody is using it, it could of course break uh, backwards compatibility in that case. Okay. So we aren't using it because it doesn't work. So. <laughs> I mean, pr no. probably a better way would be just to deprecate two path and create uh, something similar that would then see people people would start to use, right? Okay. The other thing is, um, uh, while you answered it a bit on the last slide, uh, that this is going to happen uh, tomorrow during the hackathon, but it would be really helpful to have this Nix packages pinning thing somehow documented, blocked, whatever, because this uh, is a quite useful piece of code and um, useful mindset. 
Yeah, I think uh, Gabriel uh, Gonzalez and, and you know their team uh, actually created a pull request and they plan to move it to a wiki. Um, but then it also depends if do we need that if we're going to get Nix 1.12, you know, there's, yeah. Um, so, but yeah, there, there is a pull request open for that already. But the main problem is you have to always copy paste this to, to every place, right? Because it, it's a bootstrap process. Uh, last question. Uh, not really a question. I just wanted to make a remark. It seems like that in the beginning, you always think, ah, we're just building like a simple language. It runs only at like evaluation time. So like features in there aren't really that important. And then a couple of years later, you find that like any simple language eventually turns into like a fully featured programming language. Then you have one guy who suddenly really needs something like a profiler, right? Or maybe a debugger and these kind of things. And I think that is an, an interesting insight. And another thing is that from the same idea, you say like, oh, okay, in the beginning, because it just runs at evaluation time before I deploy my machines or evaluate my OS and so on, you don't really need like types. And if it crashes, it's not so bad because it crashes before something bad happens, right? But then you end up with like a million lines of code in uh, Nix packages and then uh, you have multi-hour time loss when you get exactly what you said with the anonymous function in the unknown file, right? So I think those are interesting insights. Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, well, first of all, Elko always says, you know, Nix is not a general purpose uh, program language, right? So the fact that I recreated this whole uh, framework of doing benchmark is probably, you know, our fault. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that we can fix most of these uh, bumps and, 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 and make this language actually good enough and live with the, with the fact. But, but this white space thingies and so on, don't make it too nice uh, when, when you, you know, and um, yeah, I, but in general, I agree. The more you use it, the more tools you need around it, right? And uh, I, I think that at the end, we will end up with, with, with all of that at some point.